you know, the 50 freestyles, a lot of stress. We saw a lot of the favourites were all muscling up and he was just, he came out to race for the final with this massive smile on his face and he waved at the camera and I was like, and he was so relaxed. I was like, the kid's going to win. He's going to win. And he dived in and he just took off and he won the Olympics by a mm. huge margin. So he went from being like number 20 in the world to Olympic champion in the space of two months. And even I see you watch him celebrate and he's looking at the board and he's like, what? <laughs> <laughs> I've just won the Olympics. They're across the pool. Jones, Cielo, Schoeman, Manadou's up there as well. Irvin's behind them. Cielo's got work to do here. Jones and in lane seven, Manadou's a huge charge. They're going to hit the line. Manadou, Jones coming at him and in lane six, but Manadou's won it from Jones and Cielo. Well, a brother joins a sister as an Welcome to the Greg Bennett Show presented by Any Question. I'm your host, Greg Bennett, and I have just recorded one of the most fascinating conversations with one of the greatest coaches in the world, Mr. James Gibson, extraordinary athlete in his own right, going to the Olympics, being a world champion. He actually was a world champion for the 50 meter breaststroke, but has gone on to just become one of the world's outstanding swim coaches, numerous gold medals at the Olympics under, with a number of his athletes and just his mindset and the psychology that he heavily leans on um, in preparing his athletes to get them ready for the Olympic Games. Wow, there were just so many quotable quotes in this one. I really did enjoy it. And even if you hear at the end of the show, I said, look, we got to sit down and do a part two because I just found this conversation absolutely fascinating now just a little bit of housekeeping again before we go on i just want to thank you as always for listening to the show it's just wonderful to see it grow and starting to reach all corners of the earth and everybody enjoying it and it's all because you're listening uh so many of you are sharing you're giving me feedback i'm doing everything i can to incorporate the feedback and make the show better for you so you can enjoy it and and listen to it uh, you can go find James at anyquestion.com forward slash James Gibson Swim Coach. And you can use that link to go ask him questions because I know I can't get to every question out there. Actually, I missed a few of myself I was hoping to get to. But you can go to any question and you can ask James questions there. You can listen to his answers that he's already got there. He's got 308 uh, answers at time of recording. And you can go ask uh, any other experts questions and listen to their answers across the whole platform as well. It's just an outstanding way to, to learn from the greatest minds in the world. I hope you enjoyed this one as much as I did. And remember, success comes to those who endure just one moment longer. All right, today I'm joined by an icon in the swimming world. As a swimmer, he collected World, European and Commonwealth Championship titles and as head coach of the ISL Championship winning team, Energy Standard. He's led the team to win both in 2019 and in 21. And he was second in 2020 with that team. Just an outstanding performance. He's coached some of the greatest swimmers on the planet, including Sarah Sostrom and Chad LaClos and Florent Manadou. And I'm sure I'm screwing up all of their names, but they are some of the greatest swimmers on the planet, just to name a few. And on the Any Question platform, he's just been absolutely outstanding, dropping just tremendous knowledge from training and technique to recovery and mindset. And he's just shared this knowledge with just such personal authenticity that makes you feel like you're sitting in a room with him and it's an honor and privilege to have him join me today so welcome and thank you for joining me on the greg bennett show james gibson how are you mate hey greg uh, good morning good afternoon um thank you for having me on it's a real pleasure to be here uh you've given me one hell of a introduction so hopefully i can hopefully i can live up to that thank you very much <laughs> well mate we've had a few troubles just getting ourselves to recording here we've finally i think got some decent audio i don't know if it was your end or my end you're in italy i'm in south florida Somehow we're making this work. Yeah, the wonders of the World Wide Web, eh? <laughs> <laughs> well, like I said in the intro, you, your answers on any question have just been outstanding. You've, you've done 300 plus answers. You, you've 
uh, you know, answered some tremendous questions out there. And, and you have the whole team at any question just going, oh, we love the way James answers questions, the way you set up your, your, your phone and you, you really make it feel like you're talking to the individual on the other end. And obviously your knowledge and the content that you're dropping is just absolutely fantastic. So we really appreciate it, mate. No, and no, no, honestly, thank you guys for developing such a wonderful tool. You know, when I, like I'm engaging heavily into the, into the system at the minute, um, purely on the fact I know what it was like when I was a young coach and, uh, and I'm trying to look for a quick fix and some, well, just some assistance in what you're doing. And just the fact that that platform, you can throw out a question to a range of, a range of experts and, you know what? I've, I've been studying. You get one one question, and you get twenty different answers to the same question. And and uh, I think that's the beautiful thing about sport is that everyone does it differently. Um, there's no right or wrong answers. You get athletes that compete uh, in all different uh, events from different areas of the world, and they're all trained different. But yet, the winning margins can be hundreds of a second. We can get ties. You can get an athlete from uh, Japan race against an athlete from the USA, and they can tie doing two totally different programs, brought up in two totally different cultures. So I'm still educating myself. I believe we have to self develop, and the, the the platform is helping me. I'm really engaging in it because it's a tool that I never had as a young coach, and I really wish I did. I think you know the community will will grow because of this. The swimming channel on the platform has just been absolutely outstanding. And like you said, you know, you'll have uh, one question, you'll have 20 plus answers from all the world's greatest coaches and athletes all giving their opinions. And they don't always agree that it's not always the same. It's one of my favorite things to do actually is to scroll down and look at the answers all from one question. And when you have coaches like yourself and you might have Michael Boll or Bob Bowman, you know, and, and all of these, um, I know I'm leaving out loads of other fantastic people on there, but it's just fascinating to see your personalities shine through and the way that you coach. And I almost sit there and go, okay, if I was a swimmer, who would I want to have coach me and who works with my personality? And And one thing I liked about you is the way that you approach it looking at athletes and their backgrounds and their cultures actually affects the way that you coach them. I find that fascinating. And, and maybe you can tell me just a little bit more about that because you've been thrown into this ISL um, racing, which I want to get, dive into in a little bit more. But I'm, I'm also intrigued about how you came up with this concept of communicating with all these athletes from the, around the world by understanding their cultures. Okay, Greg. So I come with yeah the coaching a little bit differently to some of the the best coaches in the world, and you know I think I, I obviously don't know everything. I I know a little bit. That's it. So what I try and do is just you know I demonstrate the little bit that I know, and hopefully it plugs people's gaps out there. But I, I honestly believe coaching. I'm coming. I come from a psychological background, so I'm a big fan of psychology. I work with psychologists. When I was an athlete, I always had a psychologist working with me at Energy Standard when the program was working full time. And honestly, Greg, it's not just for swimmers. It's for staff. The staff need it as much as the athletes because you have to deal with the uh, the elite, the, well, the best athletes in the world. So you have to be as good as them. And staff have issues as well as athletes. So, and, you know, it's all about effective communication within a team. But going back to your, your question, I got sidetracked a little bit. I, I honestly think, think coaching is about fit. It's about how you fit with the athlete you're working with. And to assume that an athlete comes into your program and you will gel is just a thing of the past, you know. And so what I, what I did, I, I worked in France for four years at an elite high performance center in Marseille. And working with athletes from a different culture, you really have to take a step back and learn about them to make them, to have effective communication and make them tick. So, and they all behave differently. And I, I kind of realized that my effect, I had to go back to basics and speak very my, well. My coaching in France was I had to speak very basic because that was all my knowledge that I had of the French language. But it was actually mm. very effective, and I had to adapt myself around the athletes because I was in their culture, I was in their environment as an Englishman. So I had to learn to be flexible, and I, and I kind of took that into Energy Standard in 2016, a, a lot later down the line, and. It, working with Russians, Ukrainians uh, initially, and then South Africans, um, uh, Australians, Americans, British, 
you re- what you realize is that everyone is different. Mm. It doesn't actually matter if you're born in, in Moscow or Kiev or, I know it's controversial right now, Moscow or Kiev or, mm. or Miami or, or Cape Town. You, everyone grows up with different parents and you have a very different childhood and you see the world differently to anyone else. And, it, and it's the same in your hometown. So two, two kids from Miami grow up with two different parents. They're, they're very different people. They have different cultures. They have different learning. So what I figured out over time is it's as a coach, now we have to adapt to the person that we're working with. And we mm. really need to find out like what is important for them because I know what's important for me. I know my coaching philosophies. I know my values, but sometimes they're not aligned with that, that athlete. And that's why you do see in sport a great coach and a great athlete, they, but they can't work together because they're coming at everything from different psychological ang- angles. So I, I think it's a take now this in this era that every coach should take a lot of time to really understand the person you're working with. It doesn't matter if it's PT work in the gym, if it's private coaching, if it's swimming lessons, you really have to understand who you're working with and how to make them better because they have to believe in you. You are the leader of the program or you're, dr- mm. you're driving the program. And so they have to believe in everything that you're, you're doing for them. And that's on every level, triathlon uh, for the social worker, the, the, the professional novice, I call it as well, the professional athlete. You have to believe in what your coach is, is telling you or you won't, it will never work. What I love about that is understanding how relationships work. I mean, if you talk about you know, your relationship with your partner, with your kids or whoever it is, it's, the coach athlete is such a relationship that, and it takes constant communication and constant understanding, constant respect of each other, trust, all of those things start to, you know, really become a part of that equation. You know, music to my ears, the whole psychology conversation, we'll dive into that a lot more later. For me, it's always fascinating to delve into how we can use the human brain to get better performances out of ourselves. But I just, I love that relationship that you've created with your athletes. Before we go too far on, I, I want to firstly talk about the ISL. From what I understand, and you can give me a bit more clarity, it, they've actually had to postpone it for 2022 with everything going on. Yeah. But I might let you explain, because I think you can do a better job for my listeners, firstly, what the ISL is and what it means to swimming to some degree and you know a bit about why it's been postponed in 2022. Right. Okay. So the International Swimming League uh, was, was formed... Uh, really, with the, 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 by the mindset of um, a brilliant man called Konstantin Grigorishin. He's the chairman of the ISL board. The idea was to move in its purest form is to move swimming on as an entertainment platform, bringing what was traditionally known as an individual sport into a team sport. And actually, the ISL in itself, it doesn't really have a lot to do with swimming other than the racing. It's all about team tactics, team games, point scoring that's, that's different before you're scoring points for the team. I know you guys have the NCAA's championship that's just been won by Cal Berkeley in the USA, but it's an extension, let's call it, of the NCAA system, which is a team-based, well, team-based, and it's more of an entertainment product rather than just what you see swimming as once every four years on the TV at the Olympics, gets incredible exposure, then mm. just disappears. So, the idea is to monetize it, create a league that's sustainable long term with sponsorship where athletes can get uh, rewarded fairly for their participation. In its purest form, the Olympics does not pay athletes, that the athletes do not get um, receive money from to compete in the Olympics, but that may all change in the future. We hope so. But uh, swimming, as it's like any Olympic sport, the athletes don't receive, let's call it, apart from one or two, your Michael Phelpses of the world, Kayla Ledecky's, Caleb Dressel's, there's only really one or two that receive a serious salary. And you cannot even compare Olympic sport really to what you see at the NFL, NBA, Premier League football. Mm. And it's there's a disconnect between the number of people in the world that are participation in, in swimming. Swimming is the highest participation sport in the world. There's a disconnect between the number of people participating to the number of people that are actually engaged in in elite swimming. So something needs to change. So that's why the ISL was developed. It was, it was developed as a business that's not beat around the bush to try and monetize swimming and also reward uh, the athletes. So last year we had... 320 of the best athletes in the world involved swimming for 10 different teams. Uh, we've so far, 
We've hosted, I think it's around 50, 50 matches in total over three years. That's in total. There's been three grand finals, one in Las Vegas. And with my team, Energy Standard, has been at the forefront of that. We've, um, we're, we won in Las Vegas in 2019 and 2021. There's been numerous world records. Uh, we, it, the idea behind it is to try and change the perception of swimming. It's not a boring sport where people uh, swim up and down. Try and build the athlete personality into a media personality where that athlete can be seen more often on NBC, ABC, BBC, all around the world. In essence, we were on our way to launching season four. Season four was supposed to be uh, 26 matches in total, uh, all different various global destinations, Toronto, USA, Asia. Just what's happened in the last four weeks, we have to be realistic about what we can do. We have outstanding obligations to the athletes from 2021. So uh, we've decided to postpone for a year mm. because of global events, what's going on there, because where the majority of the support for the ISL financial support comes from. And it's not really appropriate to be spending millions on a, on a league at this point when the country that basically that supports us the most is, is enduring difficult times. And uh, that's, that's kind of the main reason behind it. So we can, you know, we'll take this year to really firm up all obligations in front of the athletes, uh, look at the senior management team of ISL, what we've learned from the previous three years, what we can make better, uh, what we can improve on to improve the product for the show, really. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of what was what's behind the postponement. And, and that's what our product is. It's a fantastic strategy game that involves swimming, but is not necessarily swimming like American football, you know, sorry, US football, as you call it, it's a strategy game. You know, you can't win a, a football match without an amazing strategy, changing strategy to, and being reactive to every play. And that's kind of what we wanted to do with ISL. I love it. It, it seems very similar to the professional triathlete organization, you know, which was established also sort of just pre the pandemic and, you know, they've, they've been able to keep it going. They've had some good investing a bit like you guys have had with the, with the ISL, yeah. but it hasn't been smooth sailing. How, how much is the, of the ISL is controlled by the athletes themselves? So the athletes, they, um, they have a, an alliance group, which they have an input on. So the main, the main rules and regulations will always come from the ISL senior leadership team and the technical director of ISL. It, and going through the teams then are responsible for recruiting the athletes and any sort of communication and move forward comes via athlete groups with the general managers of the clubs. Um, so my role has actually changed in recent years. I'm the CEO and general manager of the club at the minute. Tom Rushton, uh, my colleague, is the head coach. I'm still involved a little bit with the coaching, but he, he takes more of a leadership role there and I'm more day-to-day business sides. Mm. Um, but the athletes are um, uh, always consulted. We always speak with them. My first thought goes to, and it's the same sort of questions I asked, you know, the CEO of the Professional Triathlete Organization when I had him on the show was looking at the sustainability model for it. So I guess at the moment it's a little bit driven from investment side of things? Is it going to be sponsorship driven? Is it going to be sort of tickets at gates or is it TV revenue? You know, and and I'll move in, I'll move off this in a moment, but I'm just sort of, my own curiosity has me wondering the sustainability model and how that's going to work. Well, Greg, it's all of the above. It's all of the above. Ticketing, Mm. merchandising, uh, TV revenue, sales. We developed an OTT platform subscription for the year to watch to watch all the the ISL. So it's it's all of the above. And at the minute, you know, we are heavily reliant on financial investment. The ultimate goal, and I've we spoke with many. I've spoke with CEOs of uh, betting companies, one of the biggest betting companies in the world. Mm. Everyone is interested in in the product. They think it's fantastic. It's got to grow authentically over the way it has done over the first three years, and it's still growing. We, where we started off with, you know, I guess with the Pro Triathlon League, it starts off with very little interest, and you're almost trying to bang down doors to, for, for broadcasters to, to put you on their channels. Now we actually have the broadcasters approaching us. How can we get involved? Which is fantastic. And but it's it's not a quick process no. to, to go from being streamed 
on on big platforms for free to to monetize in that is it's not a quick process but we're getting there and it's moving in the right direction first off you need eyeballs uh on the screen and we've got some great partners um with, with very established uh tv networks and so it, that's the first step of the process and then the sponsorship we actually last season we had um a range of league sponsors coming on board which is great and you know that's it's it's a stepping stone to keep moving forward step by step but you know it's it's not easy these things are challenging especially to start off something from scratch i think the indian premier league in cricket is probably the best example of a startup mm. that's been turned into a multi-billion dollar industry you know that's the one we've got to emulate and it, it's a lot of hard work and a lot of effort from a lot of people but it's you know it's it's all going to be worth it if these athletes one day you know you're not reliant on your fifteen thousand dollars a year grant from your federation but you can actually you know be be truly truly self-sustainable have a pension and <laughs> uh, you know you know a pension in the olympic sport world is is something that uh, you know it's what it's like a unicorn is it you never see it it's a thing of mystery but in a business world uh, you know you wouldn't think about working negotiating a contract without your pension the idea is to make drive the sport make it more professional I know what it's like to start a, a new company and get people excited about it and get everybody on board, the amount of lift that you guys are having to do. And, you know, I've watched plenty of it. I think it's fantastic um, the way that you're promoting the athletes, promoting the sport, looking to ways to make it more enticing and entertaining for the fans. So kudos to everything you're going and doing there. It, it really is fantastic. And for people listening, go check out, um, even if you go back and look at some of the repeated events and races and the atmosphere and everything, it really is outstanding. So um, congrats on all of that. I just want to shift gear a little bit now and talk about you. Okay. I'm curious just to learn how you found swimming, you know, and, and just really finding that passion for swimming. Just give me a little bit of a rewind of the clock and, and tell me how you got into the whole swimming world. Right. I'll just go right back to square one. Um, <laughs> how I got into swimming was I was a, a chronic asthmatic as a child and uh, I was in and out of hospital like a yo-yo spending days in hospital and uh, uh, missing out on school time, time with friends. And um, what basically come of that was a doctor's suggestion to try swimming in a wet, damp environment uh, is actually quite good for the lungs, believe it or not. Mm. It started from a medical reason. And it was funny that the, the medical reason actually finished my career at the same time, not asthma, something else. But uh, that's how I got into it. Um, when I was a youngster, I had no aspirations of ever being an Olympian or being the best in the world. But in 1988, I remember watching every hour I could of the Seoul Olympics with my father on the television. And wow, and it almost seems seemed back then. I still think about it now. I have goose pimples what, thinking of Adrian Morehouse. That was my mm. first experience of watching an Olympics. It was, it was just magic. And I, and I think, you know, back then there was only three television stations. So every, the whole country was buzzing around an Olympics. It was the only thing we spoke about at school. I was eight years old. And that kind of got me on to elite sport. So I understood elite sport at eight. But I, again, I never had any esper. I never thought I'd ever dreamed of being part of that show. And then as I went through my childhood, uh, I didn't uh, compete really at any serious level. I competed at a uh, national level. I moved to Loughborough University uh, when I was 18 for studying, not for um, anything else, not for mm. swimming. At the 2018 Commonwealth Games trials, I finished 54th in England in the 50 breaststroke. And then four years later, I was Commonwealth champion. Mm -hmm. So success comes to me quite late. Uh, it was never something that was part of my agenda, but it happened. And for luck or judgment, meeting the right people on the on the way. So I was coached by a guy called Ben Titley at Loughborough. It turns out now that Ben was the most successful coach at the Tokyo Olympic Games. And he's, uh, he's a British guy, but he's been coaching in Canada. You know, I fell into a program that was, was run by one of the most gifted coaches in Britain at the time, young coaches. He didn't realize it then. Your life, you, you meet people on your journey, right? I was just there at that right point in time to meet Ben, but ironically, Ben uh, refused to have me in his group to start with. And 
I used to go to training at five in the morning, appear at the door saying, please let me swim. He said, no, <laughs> I never gave up on that. And it must have happened about six or seven times until he got fed up with me. Uh, and he let me into his group to, to train. And I, I want to see some of that with some of my athletes I work with. I see it in one or two of them. And I, and I see people just, you know, if I go in, I see them on their own, just practicing skills on their own. I'm like, oh, you've got it. I can see you've got some drive. <laughs> uh, but Ben, yeah, Ben took me in uh, very uh, fortunately through bullying. I bullied him into accepting me into his group. And uh, the rest is history, really. I went on to have a, have a good swimming career. And I moved to France in 2006. And again, worked with a brilliant coach called Roman Barnier. And I went on to work with him as a full time, as a member of staff with him. And had the time of my life in Marseille uh, until London 2012. I've gone a bit sidetracked. I've gone a bit more the full story than the beginning of the story. Is that all right? <laughs> no, I, I love it. I love it. it. It actually, it's. I like when I have guests that sort of just cover all. I'm just ticking off all the things that I'd love to ask you, and I say, like, "Oh, great, he's just going." So it's perfect. I one of the one of my favorite things is to firstly understand when somebody sort of realised that they had a passion, and then sort of identifying when they maybe have some talent or strengths and you kind of touched on that going maybe I've got something here and it sounds like Ben Titley really drew that out of you and I think the other part that you touched on which I really love is that understanding that work and talent are important but you also got to have that opportunity and I, I always refer back to Malcolm Gladwell with his book you know Outliers where you can work and talent and opportunity come together that's when great things can happen and, and it sounds like that's what you had working with Ben and you were able to identify that you had some talent some ability was it with Ben that you kind of pulled the trigger and said okay this is what I'm going to do with my life I'm going to go to the Olympics I'll be perfectly honest with you it was the, the talent side of myself, I still today, because I grew up, I wasn't a good junior athlete. It happened very suddenly. So to go from basically retirement, uh, number 54 in England to the next year being British record holder and British champion, which actually happened pretty much was, mm. it was, it wasn't something that my mind, you know, there wasn't, it, it wasn't a, just a switch. I decided uh, that switch came later, but for the Olympics. But I'll be honest with you, I, I still in the preparation to a Commonwealth Games in 2002. I went I went on holiday with my friends like four weeks before and got drunk all week. And then <laughs> I went back and I won the Commonwealth Games. That's after that moment was like, I actually, now maybe this is not just a bit of fun. You know, this could be quite see I could actually do something, <laughs> do something quite good in this. And so, yeah, after the Commonwealth Games in 2002, I, I really started to engage just in swimming. Then I went to the world champs. I became world champion. I was think I was the first British champion in 30 years. Uh, now this seems to be, the Britain seems to do quite well, but before we didn't. And then uh, right place, right time, right opportunity. <laughs> and then after that, you know, I think I got a bit too serious with it for the Athens Olympics and I completely bombed out there. I was was complete. I arrived at the Olympics completely dead. You know, I had nothing emotionally gone, nothing to give, and you see it all the time, actually. And you mm. can you can actually almost see all the athletes that are going to perform and the athletes that are not just by their body language on deck, mm. what they're saying, how they look. You get people that have engaged so much in an Olympic in an Olympic cycle just because it's the Olympics that they actually completely destroy themselves. And it's a journey a coach. It's so hard for a coach mm. not to go. If you've got an athlete in front of you saying, come on, I want to go, I want to go, I want to go hard, I, hit me hard, you kind of go with it. And I've made that mistake as well. And then you, you're suddenly there going, oh, God, we've messed this up. And, uh, and I, was, I was that guy in 2004 as well. You know, I wanted success. I wanted it too much. And it, I actually, you know, a combination of a young, a young coach I was working with that maybe didn't have the experience to, to know how to manage that, but does now incredibly well. And you, and you see it from a, a lot of young people and young coaches. They just go a little bit too hard on those years. You've touched on something fascinating. And uh, I, I, I quickly share my own story with 04 because I was much the same as you. I'd had the world number one for 02 and 03 was going into the Olympics as somewhat of a favorite and uh you know pulled up lame and injured and ended up coming fourth you know and it was the best I could have done on the day I actually performed out of my skin and was happy enough with the fourth after what I dealt with the months leading in but you know it wasn't until later in my career where you started to almost just enjoy being there and relaxing and letting 
yourself flow with the environment that you're in without forcing it. And I, and I think, you know, when you're in those younger days and, and you know, you, you're kind of like, you think you're meant to be super intense and super, but it's like, actually, if you can be more relaxed, if you can just enjoy the show, turn up, it's like you said with your mate, you went and got drunk four weeks before the Commonwealth Games and you obviously turned up pretty relaxed. It's, it, it, it's, it's fascinating for me, the psychology that goes with that and, and how a coach working with their younger athletes, for the most part, have this role of trying to create an environment of joy, fun, you know, relaxation, but still getting the work done, but then pulling the reins back in. And it really is an art form almost more than a science. Um, would you agree on that? No, I, <laughs> Greg, that's, that's me to a T. It's, it's an art. It's an art form. It's how to make the painting be wonderful. And uh, it, it, it just saying that, it sounds like we've got quite a lot of parallels on our, our career. So, uh, I, I'll let you know. I'll let you know what I think about my Olympic experience. But how did you <laughs> deal with fourth? I'm yeah. interested. For me, so I want to know how you dealt with fourth because I was sixth, and I want to know how uh, you know. And it, does it still hurt? No, no, it actually doesn't. And, and and I can tell you why. I mean, for one, I turned up like I said. Um, I'd managed to get about eight weeks of good training before that Olympic Games, knowing that I probably needed twelve. To win, like I just, I knew myself well enough by that point that eight weeks was not going to be enough. But twelve, eight weeks was just enough that maybe I wouldn't embarrass myself. I mean, I went in with a completely terrible attitude where it was like, just don't embarrass yourself. That was my goal. Come the actual Olympic day. Oh wow! So a, atrocious attitude going in. When I walked away with a fourth, it was a little bit like, wow. Had I had a better mindset. Uh, had I worked with a psychologist like you'd meant, like you talked about, I actually think there was more there. Even though I walked away going, I had a great result. I was fortunate enough to marry my wife a couple of months after the Olympics and, and that kind of took over. I was also blessed with the fact that I got to have quite a substantial career after that fourth, that I think those pats on the back and the little bit of success I had after that helped me deal with it a little bit. And then I'll add one final piece. And that was that my wife actually got fourth at Beijing Olympics. And so now we kind of have a very equitable house <laughs> where we both that fourth. So I don't know. And I think it also helped with, and we can talk about this a bit later, because I know it's one question you answered on any question about retiring um, in the sense that I wasn't just known as an Olympic champion or an Olympic medalist. Yes, I was an Olympian, which was kind of nice, but I, I never had that kind of badge that that's just who I am. And so I always knew from that moment on, you know, I knew myself more than just being the gold medal Olympic athlete. Or I've seen a lot of Olympic gold medalists struggle finding out who they are beyond that as a title and a stigma. Um, so a long answer to your question, but you tell me about your sixth. <laughs> no, I, I'm, inter I'm just interested to hear because everyone has a different story about them. You always get the people that win the medalists because they're the ones that come back you get off the plane, don't you? And the, you you go left while <laughs> the people with the medals go right. So that's where it starts. You know that that's where your realization that you haven't done it starts. And uh, and it, there's nothing, is there? There's no me there's no media. There's nothing uh, after you get home. And so initially, I, I you know I, I struggled to deal with it because it comes down to identity. I had my identity had gone from James Gibson, the guy that swims a bit because he, you know, he enjoys it and has a good laugh to, to James Gibson, where I honestly believe that, you know, I was defined by success, which is terrible and it's toxic. So when you're not successful, you feel no value. And because you're young as well, you don't really know how to, how to process that. So you to begin to associate your performance with your identity, which is one thing now I get like all the way down the line, like the athletes I work with, and I, I, again, it goes back to who are you as a person? Like, like, who are you? What's important for you? Oh, I have a cat. They go, oh, great, fantastic. Let's see everything about your cat. I had one guy I used to work with had nine cats and that, that was his life. And so that's his identity. I always try and reinforce, think about afterwards. I never did that. I, ne I never had that luxury. And so 
you know, I tumbled after the Athens Olympics, I tumbled into, well, it's not depression, is it? You're sad. Let's call it you're sad for a period. You know, I started working with psychologists after that point, And it was more mm -hmm. where I saw psychology as a, re it was a reactive thing as opposed to a proactive thing, which I do now, I have proactive psychology. So it was all very reactive and it was all licking my wounds. And the guy I was working with was a guy called Steve Peters and he wrote, wrote mm -hmm. a book called The Chimp Paradox. And I remember he was brutal with me. He was like, yeah, so what? Life's not fair. You know, that's life. What are you going to do? You're going to give up on everything? I was like, oh, my God. And he completely ripped me to bits, this guy. And, you know, and then we started to rebuild me over time. And But dealing with the Olympics, my own performance, you know, it's not something you'll ever get over. And it always leaves a bad taste in your mouth. But it's something you learn to live with over time. And that's when you become more sure of your identity and who you are. And I think exactly like you said, I echo your sentiments. You add mm. a lot more about you than just Greg the triathlete. So, and I think that's one thing that all athletes today, and the more we go down a professional mm. route, the more that money's involved, they do associate themselves with success. And you can see it And when they do drop off that, you know, the bad periods are coming and we just have to, as coaches, preempt that really, a preemptive strike. Gee, you said that all really well, by the way. And, and I think, I actually think because you've had those experiences, you know, you're able to put that in your tool belt going forward, the way you work with athletes now it's like you said that that preventative psychology or proactive uh, psychology excuse me I, I i just think that's you know you can study textbooks you can go to class but to actually throw yourself out into the world and get that experience-based knowledge to me there's just nothing greater you know because like you said that that sixth place when you're coming off being world champion got all the pressures and you go home and you turn left and everyone with medals turn right and you're a failure and you're successful. Yes, you get to live with that. But now in your career, you get to live with that as an extra special thing. Like it's like it makes you better so you can become one of the world's greatest swim coaches because of those experiences. I, I just think it's phenomenal. I personally wouldn't change or have – I don't have any regrets um, – for the journey I had because they are who I am today. Are you much the same? No, absolutely. And I think you, yeah, at the time, if you'd have asked me that question <laughs> a few years back, I'd have probably said, no, absolutely. It changed everything. <laughs> so I'd say I've been coaching for 10 years and the success that I've had, uh, you can really see it play out in the real world. Like you have a degree of empathy with athletes. Like uh, I, I, had, I, had a, I had a girl finish fourth in Rio and uh, she missed out on gold by six one hundredths of a second. Oh. And she missed a bronze by one one hundredth to a drug cheat. Um, her girl test, you know, she cheat, she not cheated, let's not say cheat, she t tested positive twice before. You know, you have this empathy with people and you can see it. It's not just the fourth places, the, the sixth places. You, you, mm. you understand, but you also understand what's coming with those guys. So you're able to help. It did help me, you know, dealing with athletes. You speak a different language once you've been through mm. a heartache, and it is a heartache, you know, because uh, it's it's a grief. My, my psychologist I work with said, you, you know, you're in a, it's a grief period after you don't achieve what you, you, you know, mm. your, your dreams. That's your whole life that you've put around it, so it hasn't happened, so you have to grieve. And you, you can speak on the same language as people and help them, and, you know, I, I'm actually very proud of uh, the moments, uh, the difficult moments that I've had to deal with with athletes because I know that I've really made an impact and I can see it and mm. I can help them move forward and then have extreme success after a big disappointment. And, you know, their journey doesn't end there just because they might have finished fourth or fifth or sixth at the Olympics. And, you know, people can have incredible careers like you said, like yourself, and it, that, that moment doesn't define you for sure. It, it, it hurts, but it doesn't define who you are. I think it gives you that tremendous empathy. And for the most part, that's all people want during that grief period, as you put it. They just need somebody to, to listen and understand that it's okay to be sad, that it is hard and it is a heartache. And so I think it is uh, important to have a really strong team in your corner. A quick mini break, just to remind you to go check out anyquestion.com forward slash James Gibson swim coach. Anyquestion.com forward slash James Gibson swim coach.
I want to move on a little bit here and look at some of the questions that you've answered in any question. And I've kind of split split up a group. I have a group in the sort of mindset category, some specific to swimming, some on recovery and just some of your personal opinions. And so I might quickly run through these because I'd love to dive a little bit deeper into some of them. And so I'm going to start with mindset because that's probably one of my favorite topics. And um, if we have time for everything else, we'll do, we'll do that. But the first one, there was a question actually that my mum asked, and she's asking some great questions. If you ever see Suzanne Bennett asking you a question, know that that's my mum on the on the platform. And she asked, "I have seen, I have seen," <laughs> <laughs> um, and she's just loving it. She's just she gets so thrilled when you guys are answering her questions. It's like these magical moments um, for the user to ask a question and just have incredible people answering them, remarkable people. She asked one about what does passion mean to you? And, and I loved it because you actually just threw the mic over to um, Flo Manadu. And it was about what, what, what does passion mean to, to you? And, and you, actually, you actually passed the mic on that one and didn't actually answer it. So I'm going to throw it to you right now and, and say, you know, when you think of the word passion, what are the first things that come to mind? The first thing that comes to mind is my little boy, but that's not the right answer on this one. So passion in terms of sport. Well, that's okay. No, your little boy, because what you're doing there is saying passion, there's a there's a love that that's hard to describe. It goes yeah. beyond love. So that's okay. We can start there. I like it. So that's where I'm leading. Mm. It's a love. It's a love for what you're doing. It's something that gets you out of bed in the morning. And I say love. Love, you, you go through bad periods of love. You go through great periods of love, but it has to be something you work at. But ultimately, deep down, you know, it's in your system. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. We all fall out with our partners from time to time. That's just part of the process. But the underlying factor is you still love love them in every way that you know that you should do and that's the same with sport so passion i i I believe it's a it's a form of love you'll have periods where you know you just bounce out of bed in the morning you go to training and 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 that goes to coaches and support staff as well you know you know you go through this magic period where you're on top of the world you're almost floating success is coming easy Mm. and you also go through this other period where you're like damn i'm hitting my head against a brick wall here i don't have the answers and you struggle to get out of bed in the morning and go to work. That is love and that is passion. It's it's supposed to be like that. It's supposed to be emotional. It's supposed to be high intensity and you should feel the the, the highs and celebrate the highs and be distraught in the lows because that that's that is passion and that and it comes to love. So yeah, that's what I'm going to say. My passion is a form of love. That was awesome. That was that was spectacular. I love that. It- I, I think that is a great answer and, and I love the illustration of the roller coaster of life and our emotions that go with it because it is it is like that. Um, next question. You you answered one on somebody asked, and I'm gonna get I haven't got the question right in front of me, but about belief and belief in yourself. And you answered in a way where you said never believe that, you know, you are number one. Always keep in the mind that you sort of work Believe that you're number two and work like you're number two. Am I getting that right when it was coming to the understanding yeah. of belief in yourself? Yeah. Greg, it comes from the fact that, like I said a little bit earlier, I wasn't a great junior athlete, so I was never told I was <laughs> great. Mm. You know, when I went through my you know, sort of my teens development, you know, which is critical for your mindset, and uh, I was never told I was great. I, I grew up in uh, quite a brutal environment in just – east of London and where you're in a group of friends it's quite hard where you're made fun of all the time that's just British culture by the way it's a, it's, a, it's not a good thing but you grow up to be quite hard and resilient and then I wasn't a good swimmer so I never had that I wasn't told all the time so I always had to fight for my way through in sport I had to and right, like I told you I didn't win a national championships in, in Britain until I was 21 junior or senior I was you know, 54, if I was the guy just showing up because he got a nice T-shirt at the Nationals to buy with his name written on the back. So I always fought for my spot in sport. I was always fighting for it. And I never believed, honestly, I never believed I was good until I actually swam a race and I was good. <laughs> and after that period, you know, you, do, you, you can't change who you are. That was my DNA. I was always striving to get better. I was, a, I was, I was always trying to learn to get better. I, and I did see it in my coaching. I call it the searchers. I can see the searchers. There's people that are searching to get better. And you know what? It's not rocket science, but when you are searching to get better, you generally do. I have athletes that come, 
They show me videos. Oh, have you seen what Caleb Dress was doing? Have you seen this dolphin kick? Can you help me do this? Can you say, have you seen that? And generally these people, they do improve all the time. Yes, you can't be like that 100% of the time, but I was a searcher and I was always looking. And that was kind of my thing. I, my belief was I have to keep looking to get better because I can't beat these guys just with the talent that I've got. I need to be I need to be sort of learning faster than these other guys mm. so I can beat them. So I was one of the first swimmers in Britain to do weight training properly. I mean, Loughborough University, which now is, you know, Adam Peaty is there. Mm. Um, so a lot of the British national team are there. They didn't even have a gym when I was there 20 odd years ago, there wasn't a such thing as a strength and conditioning coach in British swimming or anywhere. I had to do all that myself. And I, I teamed up with Mark Foster and we used to chat all the time. And, and we were what sort of the pioneers of that back in the day. And so that was my way of trying to beat my opposition was to be a search. I was searching to get better. And that comes back to the belief that I was always not as good. And I, and I kind of take that into my coaching. Like I don't believe I'm a great swimming coach. I don't, I'm, I believe there's plenty better coaches in the world than me, but I'm trying my best. I'm honestly trying my best to be one of them or, you know, try and with the athletes, learn all about them to make them better. If, if, if they can't search as hard as, as, as I did, I help that process. Maybe go and have a look at those videos. Mm. What are you seeing from Caleb Dresser? What are you seeing from these guys? You know, that's just kind of my mindset. That's that's how I was brought up. And I don't think I'm going to change. You know, it's a bit late now. No, I think I, I, I really like that, that whole, the athletes that are searching to be better and trying to figure out like these days it's been coined the marginal gains or whatever it is to try and be better. But I do have one question before I move off from this topic, but you did become world champion. You did become number one. So I'm curious as to what your mindset was when you actually then became, if you want to call it the man, um, was it a sense of imposter syndrome? Did it feel uncomfortable or, or what was that like for, I always say we all strive to be the world's best and maybe we get to borrow it for just a moment in time. But I'm interested in your kind of mindset of when you were the world champion. At the time, it, it felt very surreal. And I look back at my interviews and everything afterwards and I cringe a little bit because I was always talking about the next goal. What's next? What's next? What's next? You never live it. You, and that's the sad mm. thing about sport. You never really embrace your big success and you never really appreciate it until long after when you look back at it and you're like, my God, that was incredible. <laughs> oh my God. Why, why was I up at six o'clock the next morning training when I should have been celebrating this or doing this or spending time with my family and my God, my family was so proud of me, but I was always, oh, I've got to get back to training and stuff. And it makes no difference. So I, what I do with my athletes nowadays is when after success, we celebrate hard, go sp share your moments with your family and friends, because ultimately when you retire, you do drop off of people's radars very, very quickly. Mm. And the people that are still around are your family and friends and they'll be there re all the way through. So go tell them the stories. Go, like I said about the ISL in uh, 2019 when we won in, won in Las Vegas, I was like, go home, guys, and tell your family and friends all about it. Have a meal with your mum and dad. You might want to go and see, you, see, see your mates or whatever because you get limited time off, but just go and tell them all about it. Tell them how cool it was. Tell them what you've done. And the great thing with ISL is every point counts. So everyone has a story to tell. So we won the first championship by eight points, the last championship by 14 points. And, and every, it, without those points, you can't win. So everyone has their little story. It's like, oh, if I didn't do that, we wouldn't have won. We'd have finished second, which is true mm. of 32, or like, sorry, 28 people. So what I do now in coaching is I always grab people and say, go away and do this. Go and have a speak with your family and friends. It was actually when Flora Manadou won the Olympics in 2012. Uh, he had his medal ceremony and I could tell he was just, he was just going with it all. You know, he was just part of the, the show and, uh, and I, and I stopped him and he was like, oh, I've got to go and do media and I've got to do that. And I, and I forced him to get back in his swimming trunks and his goggles. I said, get in the pool. You've got five minutes on your own. And I want you just to think about mm. everything you've just done because you're never going to get this time back. And he got in the water 
on his own. Everyone else was like packing up to go home. He started splashing around like a kid. And uh, he always says to me, thank you for giving me that time just by myself. Because you do, you win a major mm. medal, you part the show, aren't you? You get passed on, passed on to the next person. You never digest mm. what's actually happened. And so, yeah, I forced him get back in the water. And when I have an athlete with great success now, I always just get in the water on your own. Just have a think about everything, your life, like what you've done, what it took to get to this moment, your family, like what it sacrifices you, who, who drove you to the pool at five in the morning when you were a kid, you know, who, who was important. Cause then you can, you just take, spend them five minutes and then you can actually see what's coming oh, next a bit clearer. As that's well. fa fantastic. So I never had that. I never had to digest that. I never got that opportunity. No. And I wish I had, you know, after Barcelona being world champion, just, I was part of the show and I, you know, I didn't experience, I didn't love it as much. Like now I can watch a video. I can almost brings me to tears, you know, cause I'm like, damn, that was me. But at the time I didn't live it as, as what I should have done. It's amazing how many guests I've had on this show. You know, I'm about 120 episodes in, so a hundred plus people and, and I've had so many of them. And if I ask them, you know, what's sort of one regret or whatever, it's amazing how many of them have said, I didn't celebrate my victories. I didn't recognize it. And I think that is like you touched on earlier. That is the, the athlete mindset is like more, 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 go, go, go. And it's like, no, you need someone like yourself, like a coach or a family member to say, stop and just take a photo of in your mind, yeah. look back, take a photo of this and let it sink in. Actually, when Laura and I, my wife and I got married, I remember one of my, my groomsmen touched me on the shoulder and said, Greg, I want you and Laura to just go stand in that corner and look at all of these people celebrating your special night, your, your time. And he said, don't come back for several minutes and just watch. He said, cause this night will fly by and you never, it was one of the best taps on the shoulder ever. Cause it allowed me to just step back and take it in. And exactly like you do with Flo Manadou and just saying, look, just stop for a second and let it truly sink in. Cause it's going to just wash over you so quickly. Otherwise, I just think that's fantastic, mate. You I can't tell how I, I tell you how impressed I am with everything you've had to say here and you know everything you've been saying on the app but this is fantastic. I, the next question I have is you were asked about positive thinking and how do you help athletes with a positive mindset before a race. I'm curious if you, if you can expand on on that answer of um, an athlete and and how they should prepare themselves. You'd be surprised about how many of the world's best athletes you see on television actually sometimes struggle with anxiety around competition. And, <laughs> you know, how do you help them? How do you help them prepare? You know, like you see these superheroes on TV, and, it, and they're all human beings, right? They're all human beings. So, what I would do always with the athletes that I work with, we have clear emotional contracting before a competition and we know what's going to happen. So, you know, it's all about behaviors on race day. So, I know myself that I have to have consistent daily behaviors. I can't be reactive to, you know, an Olympics is an eight day meet or an ISL is. You know, it's a, a, a 10 match series. You have to be consistent every day. And athletes, they pick up on you as a coach very, very quickly. You know, they know when something's up. So you have, a, mm. you have to almost be the Superman before you go to the pool. You know, you go through the revolving doors. You're like, right, you need, you've got to decide who you need to be for that athlete. So an athlete is struggling with, with, with confidence on race day. So but what you do is before a competition, you sit down with the athlete and you go through what race day will look at. You ask the athlete, what do you need from me? Mm -hmm. It's amazing how many mm -hmm. times the coach just gets in the way or speaks too much. I've, I've taken an athlete round to the call room before. <laughs> I'm not going to use it bloody good athlete mm. and he put his hand on my shoulder and went it's all right james i've got this you know he went out and he won a gold medal so, <laughs> so many athletes you know yeah they're all different like what do you need from me some i have an athlete that says i don't want you around because i want to be on my own okay fine uh, that's okay that's my insecurity if i can't handle that it's not the athlete's problem mm. you know as a coach it's dreadful because you need to be needed that's that's the idea of a coach right that's why we all do coaching because you you feel like you should be needed but some athletes don't want you around so I have it all mapped out like 
when I'm going to talk to you, do you want me here for warm up? Some athlete will want me there the whole way through, walk around to the call room, deliver them to the call room, last minute speech. But that's what they need to be confident on race day. Another athlete doesn't want to sit with the team, but there's nothing wrong with that because it's their preparation. They go and they do their own thing. That's how they prepare. Or, But it's all understood in an emotional contract between you and the athlete. Like I understand their behavior on race day. They understand my behavior on race day and everyone knows how and it's all very straightforward how they're going to react um so that's how i would deal with you know an athlete that's lacking on confidence i'd speak to them and so they've got so they're clear in their race strategy before because that gives them confidence they know how they're going to swim their race uh when you're warming them up you always pull them back to their processes and what they've agreed on with you previously and that actually gives them confidence in the moment as well mm. so that's how i would do everything with an athlete just to keep emphasizing the fact that you're okay but ultimately you know <laughs> it's over to them you you deliver them to the call room and uh you you know you but you have to make sure you've done your job to make sure you don't get in their way early uh, as well because as a coach you know you can make people better and worse <laughs> we, we don't often think we can make them worse because we're arrogant <laughs> but we can make people worse and it, that's what you do on race day get out their way if, if an athlete wants you out the way get the hell out of the way mm. it's not if they don't take it personally it's just how it is I, I love that whole answer um you started it off by saying you know many athletes you know struggle with anxiety well firstly i think anxiety in itself is the greatest fuel for all athletes. I, I, I actually like to almost preface it by saying don't struggle with anxiety. It's like you've got anxiety, you get to have it because it's what gets us fired up. And But there are some that don't manage anxiety well that I, I would say that they're like, is there somebody that can, I can lean on? And then you've got the other ones that say, I got this. You know, <laughs> it's like, oh yeah, you do have this. Okay, I, I better give you some space. Um, I'm going to move. I'm going to shift a little bit from mindset to a swimming specific question because I loved this one. Somebody asked, "What's the craziest risk for a marginal gain that you've ever done?" And I was wondering if you could expand on uh, Manadu and you prior to the 2012 Olympic Games. Tell me about that one. I'm not sure it was a, a, a risk. It was just quite nuts, actually. <laughs> so, <laughs> so Flo qualified by one one hundredth of a second at the French Nationals. The guy that finished third was one one hundredth behind. So Flo, if he'd have gone two one hundredths of a second slower, well, one one hundredth slower, he has a swim off. Two one hundredths of a second slower, he doesn't go to the Olympics. And that's in the year he won the Olympics. Mm. The stars were in a line that year because we could take risks. So he swam 21.95 at the trials, uh, which actually put him completely out of contention for Olympic medal. Like There was no chance his boys winning an Olympic medal whatsoever. And when you're in that position, it allows you to take big risks. Mm. It does because... You know, like it's more if we do the same thing, he's going to go there, he's going to make a semi final, just finish 15th. What a great experience! Good learning for the next one. That's all good. But fortunately, we stumbled across a young man that has the insane inqua aquatic intelligence. Aquatic, so I couldn't get the words out. Aquatic intelligence. Mm -hmm. You could explain technique to him mm -hmm. and he would just get it. Like I've worked with athletes where you have to show videos and underwater and they still don't un quite understand because they can't feel it. Where Florent could feel any change. So if you said to Florent, go swim like Michael Phelps, he'd watch a video and he'd just swim just like Michael Phelps. He, he just got swimming. He was a, he's a fish. The boy is a fish. <laughs> uh, we got to a point, I say we, myself, Roman Barnier and the sport team or the whole team in Marseille, it was like, I've got nothing to lose with this guy. Let's... I said, let's change it straight arm. Let's go radical. Because it was at a time where straight arm freestyle wasn't really in male swimming. Really, it was one guy that did it. It was called Fred Busquet. And he was actually in our program previously. So I understood mm. his how his, his technical model, I, I got it. And I just regurgitated that model into Florent. And I was, again, opportunity. I had the opportunity to work with Fred. I understood straight arm freestyle. And then we put it into Florent. He was exceptionally motivated. He was young. He was, say, a little bit naive to what the Olympics was. And he didn't overthink anything. It was like, Flo, we're going to change your technique 10 weeks before the Olympics. Yeah, cool, great, wicked. Can you imagine telling a swimmer you're going to change your technique 10 weeks before the Olympics like Adam Peaty? They think, they think you're insane. <laughs> and, but we didn't have anything to lose. And 
we did it and he swam like a meet and it, it was okay. It, it wasn't great. And I'm looking at the technique thinking, oh God, maybe this is not awesome. This is not as, as good, but we just stuck with it. We've got nothing to lose. And he just walked into the Olympic arena in London and he looked like he was just belonged there. You know, like he had an aura about him. No one really cared who he was at that point in time, but he was a swimming geek. He come to the finals just to watch. Like even before he raced, he was, he wanted to be in the arena. And I, I watched him. He didn't race till late on in like day seven, day eight, but he was growing in the environment. Every day his chest was getting bigger and his shoulders were, were back. You know, he's growing in, and I'm like, I'm, I'm looking at him swimming. I'm like, this this kid's on fire. And his stroke was getting more and more connected sort of every day we were there. And he was just looking better and better. And he just, he dived in and I was like, this, this boy can win a medal. He can win a medal. Uh, and I was convinced even like going around to the finals, like we, you know, he, he wasn't in the middle lanes for the finals, but he was just so chilled. And because, all, you know, the 50 freestyles, a lot of stress. We saw a lot of the favorites mm. were all muscling up and he was just, he came out to race for the final with this massive smile on his face and he waved at the camera and I was like and he was so relaxed I was like the kid's gonna win he's gonna win and he dived in and he just took off and he won the Olympics by a huge margin so he went from being like number 20 in the world mm. to Olympic champion in the space of two months two and a half months and it, it was and even I see you watch him celebrate and he's looking at the board and he's like what <laughs> <laughs> I've just won the Olympics so uh, yeah, it paid off. I, I love that story, and I'm so glad you were able to share it with me again. I did, uh, you know, you you did do a, a smaller version of that on on the app, and I just thought that is one of the best stories I've seen. There's so much to unpack in that one, not just the changing the swim stroke, you know, ten weeks before the Olympics, which nobody would ever do, but also just I don't know the mindset of the athlete and the way he just was happy to be there. And it's kind of like what we touched on earlier in the show. He wasn't stressed out about it. He was just excited to be there and wanted to play. And uh, I think that's a really powerful place. And the amount of Olympic champions we've had that have come from, let's call it nowhere, but I mean, obviously it's not nowhere. They've been there or thereabouts, but they weren't the favorites. And then they come through because they, they don't have all that burden on their shoulders. And so that that's just an incredible story. And you were a young coach at the time and it's, quite, it's thrust you onto the world scene probably quicker than you'd probably imagined as well, right? Yeah, absolutely. But in, again, we didn't we didn't overtrain him that year. Like he was fresh in himself the whole cycle. Mm. Like he was just fresh. Mm. And then when I saw Florent for four years later in Rio, I, I wasn't coaching him then. I was I was working in Great Britain at the time. It looked like he arrived at the Olympics with the world on his shoulders, <laughs> and he sw- he got silver medal in in Rio, and it was a complete disaster. And then we lost him to the sport. He he retired for a period. We didn't retire. He took a sabbatical to go and do handball, and then he came back with me. Uh, in the run-up to Tokyo, and he fell back in love with the sport. So his passion again, love. Uh, he fell back in love, and he was flying. So he, we had him. He did one of the fastest times ever ever done in January in 2020. So we're talking seven months before the Tokyo Olympics. He was on. Uh, I think he was on to win the gold. Uh, again in Tokyo and he was loving this whole experience he was like a reborn love of swimming mm. uh, and then the pandemic hit uh, my, my program started to fall apart which was the most painful experience of my life especially when you build something for four years yeah he was on then but it, I looked at his mindset in January 2020 he was just bouncing around he was the flow of 2012 it, yes the body had changed and yes the training had to change because he was eight years older mm. but he his mindset and his love and his passion was the same as what it was eight years previous. I really enjoyed this conversation. I think, you know, I'm looking forward to when you and I can just sit down and, and chat about these things in person, because I just think it's fascinating. I know I've kept you longer than we'd anticipated, but I really do appreciate it. I, I might finish up if that's okay, just with a couple of your personal opinion questions that you've been asked. And, and yeah. one of them that I really enjoyed was the wearing of technical suits and, and wouldn't it be great to just go back to the purity of a basic swimsuit? Um, what, do you, what are your thoughts on that in the future of swimming? You know, we've gone through the full body suits. Now we're just down to sort of tech shorts. Tell me a bit, bit, bit about that. Honestly, I, I, I'm, I'm quite outspoken on all this. I think we should get rid of the lot. And I'm going to go from a different reason to just athletic performance, okay? I'm going to go from 
I, I've seen the ISL. I've seen us trying to connect with sponsorship. And I know it's, it's so difficult to get these big brands, Adidas, Nike, and everyone involved because we cannot connect our product with the consumer. You're a triathlete, so may, maybe you, you, know, you, you would buy a technical suit for a competition, but the millions of people that swim every day do not buy an arena, far, uh, I say arena fast skin, sorry, a power skin, mm. an arena suit. They don't buy a Speedo suit. They, you know, they're not going to go and spend $500 on a suit. So there's no interest for Adidas or Nike or Under Armour. The big, you know, the market leaders, we can even call fashion brands as well, Armani. And I think there's no connection with the product. And the, so the, what we use in competitive swimming with the consumer, zero. The market is tiny. I, I would love to us to go back to traditional suits where this is what the public use. It's like football boots. Cristiano Ronaldo wears a pair of Nike boots Every kid in the world wants a pair of Nike boots. Mm. What's to say someone like Caleb Dressel or Michael Phelps wears this tra- this wear for when they're, they're competing and training? I'm pretty damn sure it would cross over. So I, I'm not coming from any anywhere performance. I'm coming at how to monetize swimming and make swimming great for the athlete. I, I think if we went, went back in time to, to swimsuit, uh, sorry, just the briefs and the normal suits for ladies, I think we have a better chance of becoming a mainstream sport than what, where we are right now. I like that answer. It's, it, it, in fairness, I'm just a, a fan of the Olympics and I enjoyed the stage where, and I think triathletes, we probably have that mindset where we enjoy all the tech and the new stuff coming out. It's kind of like whether it be all the different bike gear, usually it's around the bike gear, but even those speed suits, we were wearing them in triathlon and, and now we got in running these super mm. shoes, which are just... Phew, they just bounce you down the road, you know, and it does come back to sometimes I'm like, ah, oh, it'd be nice just to be raw. Or as Caleb Dressel just said in one of his answers last night on any question when he was asked about fins, he said, well, I just like swimming naked. He meant naked feet, but his answer was naked as he stood, yeah, as he, yeah. I don't know if you saw it, as he sat there in his living room with his shirt off and uh, it was like, it was a great answer. I had us all laughing. Um, but I agree with you. I think there's a purity of sport that would be fantastic to get back to. You know, I just, before I let you go, your thoughts on Caleb Dressel, what makes him so good? Is he beatable? And if he is beatable, do you have a how? <laughs> how do how do they beat him? He seems to be just so off the chart. So first off, yeah, every everyone is beatable. Caleb is exceptional. He is uh, a once in a sort of a lifetime talent that comes through. It's, you know, the sprint events are so competitive, and to win array of different events just shows you know just just how good he is. But you know, you know how you beat Caleb is you have to do something radical. Mm. You know, you cannot just stay play it safe. You know, if you're going to play safe with a with a program where you turn up, you just do what you do. You swim eight nine times a week. You do your gym. You, you know you've got to you've got to you've got to do something radical like Florent did in. Um, mm-hmm. You know you've got to make some changes in 2012. So what Florent did in 2012, he went radical. Had we played it safe, he finished his 15th or 14th. To beat him, I've, I have an idea. I've, I've got some ideas in the sprint events how to beat Caleb, of course. You know, Kyle Chalmers come close in the hundreds, but, you know, Caleb's reinventing himself now. He's got a new coach. Mm-hmm. You know, he's, he's going to find new ways of learning and Caleb's going to learn new skills to get better as well. So it's going to make him even more dangerous. But so to beat Caleb is you have to take it. You have to do something radical. You have to change your stroke. You're going to have to do a... Um, ah, I'm not going to give too much away because I, <laughs> I, have, I, have, I have some ideas. But you need to find an athlete as well, Greg. We talk about fit and uh, I've got so much more to talk about about mm. fit support staff and everything but you got to find an athlete that, that's going to want to go down that route with you you know you can say to an athlete look I, this is how what I think you should do to be Caleb Dressel and if they turn around and say you know you're nuts coach mm. and then you go okay well we're not going to do it then because you have to find that athlete with the same mindset and you have to fit if you've got a safe athlete that wants a safe program then you know you need to provide a coach that's going to deliver that as well at the same time yeah, Caleb, phenomenal. What a great guy. Nice guy, always very polite. You know, he's a great ambassador for our sport. He really is truly just one of those authentic people, isn't he? We've really had a great pleasure in getting to know him on any question. As we have you, I think that the two of you guys have just been two of our absolute outstanding favorites. I know your time is limited. I know. I'm enjoying this. Oh, me too, mate. Me too. Well, how about um, your question then on 
the top three coaches of all time. You answered this one on any question. I'm, I'm curious to hear the thoughts on the podcast. It's a generational thing with the coaches. So it's, it's difficult to actually say who are the top three because you've obviously got, you know, the Bob Bowman with his success with Michael Phelps, Michael Bowl who keeps churning out swimmers left, right and centre in Australia, Dave mm. Durden uh, winning the championships, Eddie Reese. What makes a coach great is different in, in every sort of generation and it's how they interact with people. But on this, it, I'd, what I would probably go along with the, uh, instead of answer, answering exactly who I think is, is the greatest, you know, we've all got ideas, but it's, it could be in, in many different sports. So, so I want to touch on something that I was told by a mentor that I worked with, uh, a guy called Bill Bezik. He was a psychologist at uh, Manchester United Football Club, worked with Alex Ferguson. So I consider Alex Ferguson to be the greatest uh, one of the greatest coaches of all time, mm. but the greatest coaches are the best communicators with athletes. And how many times have we seen where an athlete is in the pool or on the, on the running track on the track, the coach is screaming at them, the coach, the, the, the athlete is screaming back. The athlete is looking at the coach thinking, why are you making me do this? You idiot. The coach is going, why the hell are you not wanting to do this? And there's just a big breakdown in communication. So I think the greatest coaches in the world are the best communicators, are the ones that can explain to the athletes and sell the vision to the athletes. And they're, they're very clear in, in, in with the direction of the program that we're going. The ones, the greatest coaches in the world are the ones that can adapt to the situation as well. So situations change. What do I need to do? I need to adapt and I need to change my mode of communication to get the effective result. But Bill Bezik, he was said to me, he worked for 40 years in, in coaching and working with psychology with, with athletes. But actually, he didn't say it to me. I, I snuck into one of his lectures. So I was on a, a high-performance leadership course with UK Sport, and he was my mentor. And I, I snuck into one of his psychology lectures, and he's talking to psychology students. I'm going a bit off piece, Greg, sorry. Love it, love it. And he's like, guys, and he's talking to students going, guys, in 40 years, I figured out the athlete is not the problem. The coach is the problem. The, you have to work with the coaches because they can't communicate effectively with the, with the, with the support, the swimmers or whoever. They can't communicate with the athlete. And then they get frustrated and then they take their frustration on the athlete. And then you have to help them in their daily lives and everything. So this is why I now work when I have my support, my support team. Psychi psychologists work with my support team as well because the, they have to be good in themselves. And, mm -hmm. and I, I got Bill after the lecture. I was like, Bill, what do you mean the coach is the problem? And he was like, oh, James, you snuck in. And he was like, I knew you were there. Uh, and I was like, oh, okay, Bill, so what, what do you mean? Explain. He's like, he's like, you guys, you all think you, you, you're geniuses and you all think your way is right. Listen to the athlete. Listen to what they have to say. And, and, he, and I said, well, I do listen. He was like, but do you really listen? Are you really digesting that athlete's input? <laughs> and I was like, oh, my God. And the, the penny started to drop then. So back to your question, who's the greatest coaches in the world? They're the ones that can really communicate effectively, the ones that, you know, can adapt to any situation. And that's why we spoke earlier about why I, I, I try and find out character of group and who I'm working with. And I'm a guy from East London. I'm working with a, a young boy from Zaporozhia in Eastern Ukraine. Do you have to know everything about them and what makes them tick? So that's what the greatest coaches in the world do. Rather than mm. have an athlete come in and say, you now follow my rules. And I see that in Eddie Reese and I see that in Dave Durd and I see that in uh, uh, Alex Ferguson, you know, at Manchester United. You know, he, well, he was more of a dictator. But, mm. you know, it's, you know, you see it. So Bill, Bill told me a story about Alex Ferguson. That at half time they were losing 2-0. Manchester United were losing 2-0. And Alex Ferguson was screaming. He went down the touchline early. He was kicking everything around. Bill went and whispered in his ear, uh, every time we've been losing 2-0 to this team, we've come back on 1-3-2. And Alex Ferguson went into the dressing room and went, right, guys, great news. And it's so that language and communication. We're going to win this match because every time we, we do this, uh, but when he was, he was actually going to go in and start telling them they were rubbish and they were useless, uh, the players. So the, the best coaches are the ones that are open to communication, open to feedback as well. You have to have feedback from your peers around you. You have to have an open environment with your support team where they can challenge you, but in a, in a safe way, of course. But they, they, you have to be open to challenge from your support team always. And you have to make them feel that they're, 
just as important in the process as what you are. So not really the, the exact answer that you wanted, but something that... Uh, a I far better, a far, far better answer than I could ever imagine. It actually got me thinking about parenting. <laughs> it's like I feel like all of this, all of this also works for parents out there, I'm sure. Just listen and communicate and take, take feedback from others. I'm like, okay, got it, got it, got it. All right, let's do this. I could be a better dad. I know I can. I, I, that was absolutely an outstanding answer. <laughs> <laughs> so swimming, where it's come from, and, and, and a part of this question, where it's come from, where it is, and where do you think it can go, is more about the times of, of swimmers. So, you know, on this show, I've had Rowdy Gaines. I've had, you know, 1984 wins the 100 metres and, and is a world record holder in the 100. I've had Michael Klim, 98 world record holder, winner of the 100. I've had, uh, you know... I've had Brett Hawk on and you, and yourself, which are both around the 2004 Olympics. And more recently, I've had, you know, Bruno Fratus. All of you sprinters, by the way, all of you are just flat out sprinters. Here am I, a, you know, ex-triathlete, a two-hour event, and, and all of a sudden my, my dive into the swimming world is all around some of the greatest sprint swimmers. Where do you see the swimming times going? Can we keep finding more it just seems like the roof just keeps getting blown off history suggests that we're we're nowhere near the envelope and if you look at progression of sports and times especially you know the, the female racing we, we we thought when we saw the east german world records we'd never get there near them but mm. they take it to another level and even that so a lot of the female athletes are starting to develop male technique now like katie, katie Ledecky, ledecky she swims the lope freestyle just like michael phelps real powerful breathing every stroke sarah shosham starting to adopt more of a straight arm approach i think there's no limits on it and it's, i think it's just human nature as well that as times get better you you have to look at other ways to get better we talked about searching earlier adam Peaty broke the mold with 56 and 100 breaststroke uh, i mean not many guys had been under 59 and, until recently now you swim 59 you you don't get anything it's just you change the perception of what's possible there's always an outlier malcolm gladwell there's an outlier that will change the, the reality and the perception of what is possible then everyone goes on so everyone will research so i did a lot of research on adam Peaty. i know he's stroke inside out i know how he goes fast because that's my job and I have to. So then I can apply that with my guys and therefore everyone starts to improve. So the outlier shows what's possible, then you move forward like Caleb is doing. It's strange actually, so the men's 100 freestyle hasn't really evolved for 22 years. And this is an event that we talk sprint swimming. So Peter Van der Hoogenband, Sydney Olympics, won 47.7, which was again the outlier. And then a lot of people started to go, you know, you get the the depth of people come in, but still 47.7 today is highly competitive. And the world record is 46.9, but that's in a plastic suit, so it doesn't count. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, the world record 47.7. Uh, but still, Peter, no real underwater dolphin kick. He just dived in, two-footed dive, didn't have this wedge on the back of the block, didn't know underwater dolphin kick. So Caleb, Caleb kicks to 15 and carries the speed. So still... Peter from 20, 2000 probably has the fastest ever swimming mm. speed of a 100 meter freestyle 22 years ago. And that just showed the, the nature about how good he was at the time. Swimming will keep developing, but we'll have these plateaus in certain events where we'll get an outlier, Christoph Milak in the 200 fly, Caleb Dressel, and Adam Peaty, but then we'll just see the depth will stack up. Maybe the envelope, you know, the progression slows down, the, the world records slow down, but the, the depth of athletes at that high-end level will just is going to go pop mm. uh, you know you could maybe swim on 100 breaststroke you swim 58 9 you might finish ninth or and get win a medal you've got to go 58 7 or something i know that's, i'm just it's a lot faster mm. than that now but it, the, there's going to be smaller gaps in the winning margins in which we've seen at the olympics all the races are getting closer and even at isl you know the, the, there's always blanket finishes uh, but that's what that's where swimming's going it'll become more difficult to pick your top three as we go through which is good for the sport there's less predictability so therefore more engagement for the tv audience we're only just touching we're just scraping on what's capable in the brain and the psychology like that we've talked about throughout this episode but for me that's an area you know when we talk visualizing and affirmations and just how we can work the brain to create a hormonal response that then delivers a physical response 
um, both in training and also, you know, during an event? Is, is there something you can say that triggers something? I, I just feel like we haven't even tapped into that as a resource yet as much as I think is available to us. I think that's in all sports. I think that's the future. I think there's going to be a lot more deeper dive into that. And like you said, for most of our careers, we didn't have any psychology work. We were just like, whoever works the hardest, you know, is going to achieve, but, uh, excited about the future. Uh, what's next for you for, for this year, 2022? I know ISL being cancelled has put a bit of a spanner in the works for you, but what about the, you know, what else is on the table? Yeah. So it's a, it's a strange one now dealing with, um, first or sort of firsthand experience dealing with a lot of controversial subjects at the minute in social media, uh, and with everything going on, but I'm actually going to start working again with a couple of my Ukrainian athletes that have been, uh, able to be extracted from Ukraine. Uh, I've now got one in Turkey. Uh, I'm going to start reestablishing some of their programs. Uh, and that's kind of it really from now. Uh, I'm going to hopefully get out and see them in a, in a couple of weeks and start really putting together a good program for those guys because they really deserve it for what's happening. And like I said, you, we're getting stories of what's going on in the world at the minute. I think the world's in quite a bad place. And, you know, uh, I'm, but it's good to see that sport can still prevail and carry on. Um, and that's kind of where I'm at at the minute. I still run the club. I'm CEO, still CEO and G, GM of Energy Standards. We still work together as a unit with some of the coaches um, that are based all around the world at the minute with, the, with some of the Energy Standard athletes and just try and keep as connected as possible. That's it from me. That's my year. Yeah, Mabel, it's, it's definitely been a crazy last few weeks for you. Um, and like you said, and the world, but I know you firsthand working with so many of the, the Russian Ukrainian athletes and, uh, and swimming being backed, um, uh, by that part of the world. I think it's been a lot for you to carry on and, you know, we really appreciate you being on any question and just, uh, the way that you answering such of so many wonderful questions. And I know you, there's a lot of people answering questions that right now that are having magical moments of their own when they when they wake up in the morning and they get an answer from you. I know it's a very special thing for them. So, you know, from us at any question, I want to say thank you for that for sure. I also just want to thank you for coming on this po- podcast episode with me. It's been absolutely delightful. I think we could easily do a part two. I think we could take a deeper dive into many, many areas that I, I didn't actually even get to cover yet, but I, I um, have truly enjoyed it, mate. So I really appreciate you coming on. Oh, thanks, Greg. And next time, you know, if I'm around South Florida at any point this year, I will come and have a beer and we can we can record this together. Oh, mate, music to my ears. Wouldn't that be a fun episode? A couple of beers, hit the record button, South Florida by the beach. I love it, mate. So you definitely keep me posted. You've got all my details. I really appreciate it. For everybody listening, you can go to anyquestion.com forward slash James Gibson Swim Coach and you can use that as a referral link to go in there and you can ask James questions. You can listen to all these answers. You can look at, listen to all the other experts' answers across the platform as well. Um, you can also find all the show notes, timestamps and links and coupon code to this uh, podcast at bennettendurance.com forward slash media. Cheers, Greg. Cheers, guys. Thank you. Thanks a lot for listening. If you enjoyed the show, your support would truly be appreciated. You can visit the Patreon page or you can subscribe with your podcast app of choice. Don't miss the next episode, so subscribe and be notified. For show notes, if you want to know more, please visit bennettendurance.com. I'm Phil Liggett, and on behalf of Greg Bennett, here's to the next time, and I hope you will join Greg again very soon.